Noche y del pueblo, de la justicia y del sol. Oramos hoy por la vida y por tu creación. Fueron siguiendo las huellas del Salvador sin temor, con la pasión de la historia latiendo de amor. Desde las casas y templos hacia murallas en luz, frente al poder hoy hablamos siguiendo tu voz. Es tiempo de la justicia, el tiempo de estar de pie. Danos visión, danos fuerza de andar sin ceder. panes y peces hasta toda hambre saciar en compasión y clemencia tu amor nos guiará si unimos todas las manos más fuerte es nuestra oración si a pobres y humildes oprimen, verán nuestra acción. Dios de cansados y heridas, sánanos en tu verdad. Aun si nos cierran las puertas, sabremos entrar. que incluye Dios de quien no tiene hogar danos palabras y acciones para proclamar celebra tu credo y tu raza tu nombre el color de tu piel tu edad a quien amas tu cuerpo Dios ama tu ser, no importa cuál sea tu herida, no importa lo que quede atrás, lleva al altar hoy tus cargas y renacerás. Aquí está tu hogar Ven aquí tienes familia Aquí está tu hogar Good afternoon everyone. I hope you all enjoyed our hymn. Um, as much as I did. I know I was singing and dancing on the background. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining us. That hymn was um, really written by David Lamott just last year celebrating our 85th anniversary. Um, this version, we have so many versions, you should really check out our playlists on our YouTube channel. This version is translated by Gerardo Oberman and arranged by Horacio Vivares. Um, so maybe look out in the future sometime for an event where we'll actually premiere this hymn with all of you. So again, thank you all for joining us. Feel free to take a minute to add your name in the chat. Let us know where you're calling from, um, who you're representing, your organization or congregation. Um, yeah, so just we want to hear from you. Uh, my name is Rachel Baker. I am the uh, communications director for the North Carolina Council of Churches. Previously, I served as program coordinator for our immigration program, the Ecumenical Immigration Alliance. Most of our work in the past couple of years was centered on sanctuary in North Carolina. Um, 
And that was when, you know, the administration switched over in 2017. We had a lot of folks entering sanctuary um, as a last resort, either that or they were being going to be deported back to their home country. Um, so we had um, up to seven at least in sanctuary in North Carolina. Um, Recently, we had only about three or four. And since this new administration transition, I am so happy to be seeing news and hearing from everyone that they're able to leave sanctuary and go back to their homes, um, returning to their families. Um, so that's just you know amazing, amazing news that I've been seeing this past year. Um, but yeah, so the council has long supported vulnerable and excluded people. We worked for labor and housing protections um, protected for migrant farm workers when many of them were African Americans traveling up and down the East Coast. Um, our commitment to farm workers continued even as their demographics changed to a primarily immigrant Latinx population. The commitment expanded to include broader issues of immigration, a position that remains consistent with our guiding principles since many of today's immigrants, especially those who are not documented, are among the um, most vulnerable and excluded people. So during this session today, I'm really excited. We are going to be hearing from Reverend David Fricaro. David is the Executive Director of Faith Action International House. Prior to coming to Greensboro, David worked on interfaith and ecumenical cooperation with the Interfaith Youth Corps in Chicago and the National Council of Churches in New York City. He has also worked for the Riverside Church in New York City as the coordinator for Sojourners Visitation Ministry with detained immigrants and asylum seekers, the group that inspired the independent movie, The Visitor. Um, David is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and has served as minister with two congregations in New Jersey. He has been a human rights volunteer for the UCC in Bolivia, Kenya, um, and East Timor, and with the United Nations. David is a graduate of Union Theolo Theological Seminary, his Master's of Divinity, and Columbia University, Master's of Human Rights. And prior to graduate school, David worked as an actor and singer performing in theaters across the United States. Wow, David, that is a bio right there. And we're so grateful to have you here. You, it seems have, you have done a lot. Um, just a little bit about Faith Action International House. They serve and advocate alongside thousands of newcomers each year while educating and connecting diverse communities across lines of culture and faith, turning strangers into neighbors. In this workshop, David is, David is gonna be presenting about some of his work and what people of faith and conscience can do to advocate for our immigrant neighbors during this next election, uh, this um, legislative cycle. Before I turn it over to David, I do wanna open up our time with a land acknowledgement. This um, land that we reside within and depend upon is the stolen land of indigenous people taken through forest removal and colonialism. North Carolina holds the largest indigenous population east of Oklahoma and acknowledging our indigenous neighbors, in addition to the reality of our history, is one of the ways that we seek to do justice and walk a path toward accountability and solidarity. Um, I just want to uplift where that where I live in Durham, North Carolina, this is the occupied land of the Shikori and Eno. If you know the name or names of the people whose land you call home, I invite you to share those names in the chat. If you do not know, this is just an invitation for you to learn more about the land you occupy. We'd like to pay our respects to all those who have um, we have named in the chat, to their elders past and present, and honor their connection to the land, water, and community. Thank you all for honoring these communities alongside us. Um, just before we move on to the presentation, I wanna let you all know that we will be collecting um, any and all questions you may have. So please just add them in the chat during the presentation. We'll bring them up in our Q&A session just right after. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Rachel, for that very thoughtful um, introduction. Um, I've been a, a fan and partner with the North Carolina Council for Churches for many years and have a tremendous amount of appreciation for the work and ministry uh, that, uh, that you all provide. So thank you very much. As many of you on the phone know, uh, North Carolina has gone through some pretty rapid demographic shifts over the last 25 years, bringing tremendous new ethnic, cultural, and religious diversities to both our large cities, your Charlottes, your Raleigh's, your Greensboro's, as well as our small towns, your Morgantons and Roanoke Rapids. 
as you can see here, we're actually in the top 10 states of growth uh, in terms of newcomer populations uh, over the last 25 years here. You can see the demographic uh, breakdown uh, in terms of where newcomers are coming from. A lot of this diversity comes on top of what has been uh, a very complex, at times very shameful history between black and white populations with some proud uh, and, and beautiful moments, um, including the movement for justice today through the Black Lives Matter movement uh, throughout North Carolina and this country. And in a sentence uh, or so, that's kind of the story of us right now. And we believe each individual, each congregation, each community has a crucial choice to make. And that is, will we fear one another as strangers or embrace one another as neighbors? And I know that sounds like a very Mr. Rogers-esque way of framing the whole immigration issue. Uh, but from uh, our perspective, it's actually this deeper question that sits at the, at the core, at the heat of the immigration debate in this nation and internationally. Faith Action has been trying to help Greensboro and other communities uh, increasingly across the state and nation answer that stranger or neighbor question together. And as Rachel mentioned, we do three things. We serve about 3,000 newcomers from over 60 countries each year, the majority of whom have limited or no immigration status. Uh, providing direct help with food, housing, healthcare, legal services. Uh, we're especially well known for our ID card program for those that may have limited access to government issued forms of ID. We also spend a lot of time educating our larger community on immigration and diversity issues. So they're not believing everything they hear on the evening news or in political debates, but are learning to kind of take off that political hat and put on their faith hat on this, uh, on this issue. And then the third thing we do is try to bring those two groups together. Newcomers we serve and advocate alongside. Larger community we're educating. So as much as possible, they come together just like you're seeing in these pictures to eat to laugh, to sing, to cry, to dance, to kick a soccer ball together, doing what God hoped God's diverse people would do so that strangers in our community become neighbors. And when we say strangers, we don't mean by any means immigrants as strangers. It means we're all strangers to one another uh, until we build greater understanding, trust and cooperation, kind of the DNA of positive human relationship across those lines of difference. Many of you on the uh, call know this, uh, but um, a big part of what makes us faith action is not that we promote any particular faith, but the shared values of many faiths and cultures around immigration. And those values include the inherent dignity and worth of all human beings as a part of God's creation. Calls to certainly welcome the stranger, something that is deep in the uh, Judeo-Christian heritage and in many other religious and spiritual traditions and to love our neighbors as ourselves were the two most important commandments upon which our entire faith uh, is, um, is, is, is held. Um, and we remember the story of the Good Samaritan um, in which it was somebody outside of Jesus's own culture, faith, nationality, that was lifted up as the best example of God's love in the world. How do you take two groups who may fear one another as strangers? on a heart and mind journey to embracing one another as neighbors. And for us, it happens in four steps. It starts with education uh, about one another, learning from reliable non-biased facts that deepen perspectives, challenge stereotypes about our newest neighbors. And a lot of people say, well, that's all we need is education. It'll change the world. And uh, we think it's that cru crucial first foundational seed, but that seed's not going to grow until some additional elements are added. So as quickly as possible after that initial education, we think it's important for there to be exchange between these two groups to eat, to laugh, to sing, to cry, to dance. Um, you know, just getting to know one another more on a human level and not just once through the yearly multicultural Thanksgiving, but through numerous exchanges. And through those exchanges, we get deeper and deeper into getting to know one another. Um, we figure out where our differences are, but where our shared values are as well, and where our shared concerns in the community lie. Because if we both have shared concerns in the community, that means step three, we can put our faith into action together, um, whether that be working on environmental justice issues, uh, police community relations, immigration issues, whatever uh, it, it, it might be. But usually people don't take action until an issue becomes personal for them. And that's why we really uh, believe this, uh, 
this getting to know one another process is incredibly important. And then finally, if you've had an opportunity to take this journey with uh, a, a group who may be different from you in culture, faith, nationality, et cetera, be sure to share that story. Um, make sure that story doesn't just stay within your faith community walls, but you write it in local editorials, you post it on Facebook, uh, et cetera. Um, there's a plenty of stories of conflict when it comes to people of difference. Uh, what we need is a whole lot more stories of, of uh, cooperation um, and of moving forward and finding powerful, beautiful, strong solutions at the local level towards many of the issues that have plagued us for so long as a society. Starting with that first piece, education, just want to do a little bit of education. This is a really nice, helpful graph to show you um, in orange here, the percentage of newcomers in our uh, US population over the last 150 years, and in blue, the actual numbers of newcomers. Uh, and you can see, while uh, we're actually not at our highest uh, point in terms of percentages uh, compared to 100 years ago, but we are at our highest point in terms of numbers when it comes to newcomers in the nation. Primary reasons for migration, survival, chance at a better life, reunite with family, and forced migration. We think not only about our shameful history with the transatlantic slave trade, but human trafficking. Sex and labor is at an all-time high and in places you perhaps might not expect right here in North Carolina. There are 40 million immigrants slash refugees in the United States. If we had a little bit more time, we'd go into greater depth about understanding the difference between those two terms, although I'm sure many of you on the call do understand that the main point being here that oftentimes refugees are considered people who are forced to flee their homeland and immigrants might choose. And as many of you know, that's not always the case. There are plenty of folks that immigrated to this country that currently have no status, who never felt like there was much of a choice for them and were fleeing some of the same reasons uh, that refugees are. I always found this to be a very important and helpful graphic, especially when we do uh, congregational education on this issue. Um, status is everything in the United States. If you think of status like a ladder, the higher you are to the top of the ladder, the greater chance you have for access to social services, safety in the community, and opportunities for education, work, etc. If you have no immigration status, that puts you at risk with little access or opportunity. And the majority of newcomers in the United States and in North Carolina live in mixed status families where some have status and many others have none at all. So you'll see on the left there uh, how the population lines up in the United States in terms of status. And on the right, um, you can see we have especially high population of undocumented folks uh, in North Carolina who on a daily basis, especially over the last several years, have been um, taking a risk every time they, they get in their car to go to church or pick up their child from, from school, et cetera. A lot of people say, well, I have no problem with immigration. Why don't they just do it the quote unquote right way? Why don't they get in line? And I know many of you know this, but really under current immigration law, which really hasn't changed over the last 30, 35 years, there are really only four lines to get into. Your best shot by far is if you have a direct blood relative who is a US citizen, about 70% of your chance. Uh, and even if that's the case, it could be a six to 18 year wait. Uh, if you don't have a direct blood relative who's a U.S. citizen, about 75% of your chance is gone. Your next best shot, study your work visa. You may be brilliant, but if you never had access to post-high school education, you're likely not going to be competitive for that limited number of study or work visas. Your best next shot, humanitarian. The vast majority of those humanitarian visas go to refugees, or at least traditionally. Um, there are 60 million refugees in the world. A sliver of 1% of that 60 million ever make it to the United States. You can see how rare it is to have the opportunity to come as a refugee to the United States. And then finally, diversity lottery. It's like winning the Willy Wonka golden ticket. And really only if there's a lot of people, if there's not a lot of people from your country already here, maybe like in Iceland, and you have a specialized skill, could you enter into that lottery? Point being, unless you fit neatly into one of these four categories, there is no line for you to get into. And we would argue that that's one of the biggest myths that has kept uh, our country as a whole from moving forward um, on immigration issues and finding a more permanent solution. Uh, what are some of the things we hear about immigrants? If you all don't mind putting into the chat function real quickly some of the things we hear about immigrants these days, just real quick. What are some of the things we hear? Just put that into the chat function. Stealing jobs. What else? Crazy. Drugs. Yeah, notice I didn't ask you all what are some of the bad things we hear about immigrants. 
it's not because I believe you all uh, think you all believe those things by any means, but it's very clear that that's the dominant narrative. And a big, one of the big things we can do as people of faith is to help change that narrative. The vast majority of the people that knock on our door at Faith Action are people who have deep connections to faith and family. Tremendous bridge builders and community leaders that have outstanding gifts to offer our community if we're open to receiving them. And folks who, many of whom have been through hell to get here, um, and yet despite that, that, that journey and, and the pain behind it have demonstrated some of the best of the human spirit to survive. have been tremendously uh, innovative throughout that, that, uh, that long journey. As you all know, uh, folks with limited or no status and immigrants as a whole been dealing with a lot, many living near below the poverty line, having limited or no immigration status, living in fear. You put COVID on top of that and you have a lot of people that have been in, in some pretty significant crisis. Um, and so this has been devastating for folks already living near below the poverty line. Many families have not typically been eligible for unemployment or stimulus fund. Many um, are uninsured. Um, and so they have to go to work to avoid eviction. And many are working those frontline jobs with greater exposures. That's where we see a lot of uh, health inequities, uh, especially within the Latinx uh, community where COVID rates are a whole lot higher for newcomers compared to the larger citizen population. Um, and currently limited trust with and access to health centers and other social service agencies has meant lower rates of uh, vaccination. So now more than ever, and I'm coming to the end here, we need people like you to put their faith, whether in God or in one another, into action, and our diverse community to come together to serve, love, and protect our neighbors. I like this picture here in front of Faith Action uh, because you have independents, dem you know, Democrats and Republicans in this picture, but you had people that were willing to take off that hat and that were willing to say, we're proud of the diversity in our community. We understand we have a broken immigration system. We're going to find solutions, of powerful and beautiful solutions at the local level, and we're going to serve love and protect our neighbors together. So some of the ways congregations can help at the moment, number one, um, a lot of uh, newcomer families are needing financial assistance with rent and bills. For the last several years, we've had just a listserv at Faith Action of individuals and congregations that we get a hold of when there's a client who needs emergency help with rent or bills. And so we'll just simply send out uh, a little paragraph about um, uh, the family's needs and ask if anybody can pay for this, can they send a check directly to the rent tour or to the utility company? And that's worked tremendously uh, well. So something to consider in partnering up with uh, maybe a, a newcomer congregation or a nonprofit near you uh, to do something similar. Uh, we also have folks within faith communities that are providing temporary housing in their own homes. If folks uh, have been evicted or are without housing and at risk of being homeless, um, we have uh, congregants that are hosting people in their, in their own homes during this uh, very difficult time. Certainly donating food, diapers, masks, hygiene items, paying for legal services. Uh, we currently had a kind donor that allowed us to pay for 40 of our DACA clients um, government filing fees and to not have to have a family worry about the $500 fee to, to do that, to, to renew or for the first time get DACA, which provides a driver's license and the ability to work can be absolutely life-changing. And there's a lot of other types of legal services you could pay for. Hosting free health services um, with, or screenings or even vaccination events at your congregation. Things like back to school backpacks and holiday toys, while not ultimately um, finding the ultimate solution to immigration, that still brings a tremendous amount of hope and feelings of not being alone. Um, so things to, to really consider. Uh, several years ago, we began a visitation program where we traveled 16 hours round trip over a weekend to go and visit our newest neighbors in detention to let them know they're not alone and we'll do all we can to help them and their families through this difficult time. Um, so right now, those uh, visitations have been suspended, but hope to open up again this summer. But in the meantime, you can also write our newest neighbors. So the vast majority of people in North Carolina who are caught by ice end up eight hours south in a particularly notorious detention facility called the Irwin for Women, Stewart for Men in Southern Georgia. Um, you can also provide funds for legal consultation, phone cards, commissary accounts, etc. 
come on out and get a Faith Action ID card. Our program is not just in Greensboro, but Winston, Charlotte. It's about to launch in Wake. It's in Durham. We travel to places like Boone and Roanoke Rapids to do these uh, ID drives. Over 20,000 people now have a Faith Action ID, a Faith Action ID network card. So if you know anybody that needs it, or you yourself want to come out and get it, this is not an immigrant ID. It's a community ID card. And coming out and getting that ID can actually uh, show tremendous uh, support. And we are doing it more by appointment only right now during COVID, so the number is there to call. You can also find this information on our website, and I'll leave that a little bit later. Do you want to note we were the first city in the South to launch this program? And this program is now um, in numerous cities across the nation, from Charlottesville to West Palm Beach to Hood River, Oregon, and it began right here in North Carolina. Join the Stranger to Neighbor Congregations program. You heard me mention that Stranger to Neighbor model earlier. We got a Lilly grant this year to pair theologically um, and culturally diverse congregations together um, to go through that year-long intentional relationship building of education, exchange, faith in action, and telling the story. Uh, you have a great picture here of Daystar uh, in Espanol, a predominantly evangelical Latinx congregation with uh, Temple Emmanuel, a very uh, proud uh, Jewish reform progressive temple. We can I'm not aware of any other partnership like that in the entire country. Um, and so we have unique partnerships of six pairs in Greensboro. We're launching this program throughout North Carolina and other parts of the country next year. Uh, we actually provide a $2,500 grant to ensure your congregations don't have to dip into your own budgets. So know that that's an option. And please get a hold of us if interested in this program. Changes in federal immigration. Um, while there have been a lot of positive changes in terms of executive orders, uh, end of border walls, uh, expansion and immigration bans, um, DACA, DACA and TPS being safe, uh, ICE refocus, at least supposedly, although trust is low on violent uh, criminals, um, a lot of good uh, recommendations and, and some bills moving forward around immigration reform, et cetera. Uh, there's been um, some disappointment as well around uh, some announcements that immigration, uh, that refugee numbers may not expand this year, though that's being reconsidered thanks to a lot of the advocacy of faith groups. Um, so while there have been a lot of positive changes, there's still a long way for us to go. And note that presidential executive orders can only do so much. Ultimately, it's going to require larger immigration reform, which requires uh, both parts of our, uh, all three branches of our government to pass and move forward. So some of the things you can do now at the legislative level, because a lot of the work we do at Faith Action is a much needed life-saving bandage, but ultimately the bleeding's not going to stop until our laws change. So here's your number and essentially little script. Call your representatives and tell them to end all unnecessary and cruel for-profit detention centers across the United States. There's actually something called the Dignity for Detained Immigrants Act uh, that is um, currently gaining some momentum in the House and unjust deportation policies that separate families. Number two, we want to see the restoration of refugee resettlement numbers to a minimum goal of 125,000. There's something called the GRACE Act that would mandate this into the future. Um, and there's supposed to be a presidential determination on these numbers in May. So getting a hold of uh, your representatives telling the president to do the right thing is very important. And then finally, passing immigration reform that creates a legal pathway forward for all of our newest neighbors, those 11 million undocumented folks. The Dream and Farm Acts have already passed the House. They're going to have a tougher time to do so in the Senate. That covers about 5 million folks, which is tremendous. But we'd love to see this larger U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021, uh, which would really cover all uh, 11 million of our newest neighbors. North Carolina state laws, I'm not going to go too deeply into this in the interest of time, but note that we passed one of the most restrictive laws in immigration about five years ago that forbid sanctuary cities. That's why you don't hear about them in North Carolina, as well as municipal ID card programs. Ours is a community ID card program, not a municipal one. At one point, you could get a driver's license in North Carolina. You no longer can for the last 15 years or in-state tuition for those with limited or no immigration status. And then there's been a real push, and North Carolina's kind of been at the, the heat, the center of the heat of the argument around um, attempting to mandate cooperation between local law enforcement and ICE. So here's your state number to call, and please tell them to say yes to HB 311. Faith Action and many other partners helped to co-author a bill to provide driver's licenses for all. It's called HB 311, the Safer Roads and Communities Act. We got about three weeks before the crossover date. Right now it's sitting in a committee in the House. It hasn't, uh, and it's not gonna be able to move forward without Democrats and Republicans supporting this bill. Democrats are all over it. They like it. It's just going to require at least a few Republicans to put their necks out for this bill. 
And then say no to, unfortunately, we'll continue to play a lot of defense, SB 101 and HB 62. What those bills would do was mandate cooperation between NC sheriffs and ICE, and then punish cities who refuse to collaborate with ICE. So two bills, especially, and there's some others as well to really be on the lookout for. But SB 101 did pass, um, uh, I believe, in the, uh, in the Senate. Uh, HB 62 did pass in the House. Um, and so there's some concerns that it may require the governor to veto these bills. So important to really call the governor's office as well to do the, the right thing on that. Do be aware that there's a May Day candle light vigil across from the governor's mansion on May 1st at 6 p.m. There's a tremendous amount of grassroots immigrant led organizations that are really taking the lead on fighting back against this uh, this and, and there's a terrific coalition they're about to put out a faith letter press release um and so uh folks at ncc i'm sure will send that out uh, as soon as they 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 have that and they need your voice as well ways to stay in touch with us like us on facebook and instagram telephone number uh, my email um you can find all this information at faithaction.org, but I want to note there are many other tremendous groups like the North Carolina Council of Churches and many others across the state doing terrific work. I want to end with Martin Luther King Jr. quote, we may have come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat. I hope this was helpful, y'all, about ways you could take action, especially in our uh, congregational level and what's going on legislatively as well right now. I'm happy to take any questions. There are many other experts on the call. Really appreciate your listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, I love I love that quote you ended on. We may have come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And that is so relevant and so true. So um, thank you so much. And thank you for this presentation. Um, yeah, so everyone, please, if you have any questions, um, feel free to just add them in the chat as we go through this Q&A session. Um, we'll hope to get to all of your questions. So I do have a couple to start with. Um, we know, you know, as um, state organization it is challenging to advocate for immigration policy at a state level because most of those policies are made you know federally um so how as we um how can we as residents of north carolina advocate for positive immigration reform David, were you able to hear me on that question? Uh, could you say it one more time? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, being state organizations, it's challenging to advocate for positive um, immigration reform, but how can we as North Carolina residents maybe advocate for that since most of the laws are made, you know, federally? Yeah, so how, what we could do at the state level. Um, yeah, essentially the biggest concern right now um, for for things around immigration that might move forward is that SB 101 and, and in HB 62, which again would mandate cooperation between ICE and, and local sheriffs, um, leading to, from our perspective, uh, less safer roads and, and communities and really erode um, minimal, what's already been minimal trust between minority communities and, and, and law enforcement. Um, there's a really good chance that this may very well pass, um, kind of like HB 370 did last year. These bills are kind of copycats of that bill. Um, in the House and the Senate, in, in this particular case, uh, Republican majority um, legislature. So it may very well require the governor, again, to, to veto these bills. He did uh, veto HB 370 last year. And a lot of faith communities and the pressure that they put on the governor to, to do the right thing morally and for, for our communities really did help. So that's gonna be really, really incredibly important. Um, and then again, we hate that we've had to play defense so for so long at the state level, but, but we really do think it would be a win even if we could get just a, a few Republicans to really back this um, HB 311 driver's license bill. Um, and uh, so if you could, and uh, we'll put in chat here and make sure we follow up with some resources uh, for the numbers to call uh, to get in touch with your legislatures, le legislators. But, um, and, you know, do a local press conference. We just did one in Greensboro with leaders from Christian and Jewish and Muslim communities, uh, with the mayor, with the assistant police chief. So really creating some noise around that at the local level. Um, you know, we, we do think Virginia had 
our neighbors to the north spent eight years trying to pass a driver's license bill. We're about six years in. We do think that this is going to come. Uh, it's a matter of, 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 of um, when, but faith communities should play an absolute crucial role in moving this forward. Yeah, I cannot complete. I uh, cannot agree with you more. Um, it's very important, and I love the ID program that you all do. Um, I actually still need to get one of those um, in solidarity because I would love just to have one. And I've already been hearing from some of my coworkers on the call that they want to have one as well. Um, so I do love that program, and I, this is great that this legislation has been introduced. And um, yes, absolutely, make calls to representatives. We really do need the support on this. Um, so a lot of questions are kind of coming in. I'll just try and my best to uh, manage those and make those asks. So one of the questions that someone was mentioning, um, I think someone out West, Ron Katz, he was asking if there are any other legislators we should be contacting in North Carolina other than his in the West. Um, Madison Cawthorn is his representative, um, District 11. So it seems kind of a waste of time to contact him. Right now, um... The two that we're focused on in the Guilford area, John Hardister um, and John Faircloth. Uh, Faircloth was um, has a law enforcement background and actually made an amendment in the, uh, the bill HB 318, uh, which banned sanctuary cities and tried to ban our ID card program. He stood up for the ability of law enforcement to still recognize our community ID. So I think he recognizes the importance of a driver's license. Uh, John Hardister uh, plays a kind of second in command within the Republican Party statewide and always has been open to conversations at the very least. Um, you know, and I've appreciated that and, and generally will listen to folks. So those are two legislators we're, we're recommending uh, speaking with. But even if they come out on board, um, if, if Republican leadership doesn't even allow this bill to be discussed, uh, you know, Berger and more, you know, it's it's not going to go anywhere. So ultimately, a lot of Republicans to support this. But if the Speaker of the House says we're not going to entertain it, then it just can't go anywhere. So uh, it just speaks to the uh, incredible importance of, of, of voting. Again, it took Virginia eight years because it wasn't until eight years later that the legislature did enough of a, of a kind of um, uh, took enough of a turn to make something like a driver's license possible. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, a couple of other questions are coming up. Due to the COVID problems in detention centers, including the Stewart Detention Center, do you know if there is any push to have um, some of those detainees vaccinated soon? Yeah, and a lot of uh, immigrant advocates, human rights advocates have been very concerned about that as the rates have been just absolutely horrible and Stewart had the second highest rate um, as of six months ago in the nation of the over 250 detention facilities. And there's been several people who've died due to COVID complications. So um, it, that couldn't come soon enough. I did speak with the um, assistant warden there not too long ago about a visitation and asked that question. They're, they're not necessarily gonna let us always know publicly about exactly what the timeline is around vaccinations, but they did say that there were some efforts underway to have that happen. But I just don't think, unfortunately, they're gonna be public about that. These are privatized for-profit detention facilities, so they don't necessarily have to. Um, all the more reason to put a lot more eyes and presence on the ground there, uh, so that uh, to call out for transparency. Yeah, thank you. And I, last year, I remember hearing a horrible um, stories about steward detention and how they weren't, you know, able to socially distance, they weren't given masks. And I, I do hear, remember, there was a big issue about um, retaliation for those who are speaking out against that. So I know that was a big thing um, just last year. Um, so hopefully we really do need the assistance over at Stewart Detention and for all of our, um, most of our um, people who are from North Carolina um, are the ones who are taken there. So we definitely need some assistance in that area. Um, so for, you mentioned about donations. Um, what is the biggest need or use for donations right now? It depends on who you who you talk to. I would definitely recommend asking that question to some local immigrant leaders um, and, and groups doing this work on the ground uh, at the local level. Um, it's going to vary from from group to group. What we found at Faith Action, uh, there's no doubt, uh, emergency financial assistance for rent and bills. Uh, we did a 500% increase over the last uh, year in terms of how much we have been giving out. So. Um, you know, to ensure no family walks alone, goes hungry or homeless. Um, we're still very much in the midst of a crisis. Uh, there are a lot of our newest neighbors who have yet to be 
vaccinated. And, and so I would say that's, that's a big one. Um, you know, I would say paying for those, you know, there are under this new administration, uh, a few more opportunities to advance status. It's again, not perfect, uh, or to gain status, whether through DACA or something else like that. So again, um, finding out who those families are and offering to pay for those government filing fees, which, or, or even legal fees to pay the attorney, um, can be absolutely huge uh, for family that's having trouble just paying rent or bills, uh, you know, getting something like that covered. Uh, which can be anywhere from 500 to a couple thousand dollars is absolutely, uh, absolutely huge. Um, certainly things like food, um, you know, uh, hygiene items, diapers and things like that, you know, those would be great to, to not have to worry about as well. So, um, so I think those are some of the things that, that, that come to mind. No, that, that is great. And I'm wondering too, this was coming up as you were responding, um, if there, since so many immigrants have been left out of the relief packages since the pandemic hit. Are there, do you know if there are any efforts from organizations local in North Carolina that are specifically trying to um, kind of assist some of those families who were just excluded out of those relief packages? Yeah, I think most every organization that uh, has a fund, and there are many of them in North Carolina, um, have really lifted that up and, and said one way that folks, um, who do have means and, 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 and privilege um, that they could donate that that uh, stimulus fund um, or those tax tax checks um, in, in that for that very purpose. Yeah, great. That's um, yeah, that's so necessary right now. And I've um, yeah, I know of a couple of organizations too that have been um, on this effort. Specifically, El Pueblo was working on that. Um, and another question we had, um, someone mentioned that they have family members who are immigrants themselves um, and who are seeing children left at the border and have a hard time reconciling with that. Um, how can we reframe this narrative to have a more love your neighbor response? I, um, I don't know that I have a immediate great answer to that question. I guess I would just simply say, um, we're all flawed human beings, uh, myself in, you know, in, in included. Um, most of the children that are coming to the border, uh, you know, aren't aren't doing so for or families coming to the border. You know, if they, they wouldn't cross a desert where 60% of women are assaulted and a person dies nearly every other day due to a lack of water. If there was some kind of line to get into to quote unquote do it the right way, these are folks who are proud of their homelands but have been forced to flee because of devastating poverty. And, and violence. Um, and there may come a time due to climate change where we find our ourselves or our, our children's children in that similar, similar situation. Uh, it's really time to, to, to take off judgment and just simply put on that faith hat, see folks as human beings and, and see this as a golden opportunity to boldly serve, love and protect your, your newest neighbors. And I guess I would say when people do so, they're not only doing the right thing, but there's tremendous um, I would argue spiritual gold in doing so um, to really risk boldly serving, loving, and protecting your newest neighbors. Uh, as, as those sanctuary congregations have found out, um, that has lit a match and, and ignited a new sense of spirituality for a lot of those congregations who have taken that, that, that chance and that risk. So I guess I would just simply say loving your neighbors, not only the right thing to do, but there's spiritual gold in it. There's, there's a reason. I mean, and, and go back and read those stories. Yeah, absolutely. I love I love that. And kind of just to piggyback on that, we know so many people have just different views on immigration and the laws and everything with that. Um, and so many people find it just challenging to have honest and open conversations without it getting too, you know, intense and too, um, just a little bit too intense for, you know, to have a conducive conversation. Um, you know, I even find myself having just challenging um, time just bringing up the topic with even family members. So I guess my question is kind of two part is how can we, and you might've already kind of tuned into this, but how can we um, kind of start having these open and honest conversations of welcoming the stranger with some of our really close friends and families who may have different views. And then also how can we talk about this with maybe those family members who may not be religious? religious? Yeah, I mean, the, the loving your neighbor as yourself, to answer the second question, that, that ethic, um, 
while inherently religious in some ways, that's also a, just a straight up ethic and, and value that you can find in, in non-religious traditions um, and, and uh, for folks that may consider themselves spiritual but not religious, um, they're still spiritual cold in, in, in doing so. Um, you know, um, so those, those themes I mentioned, the dignity and worth of all human beings, welcoming the stranger, loving our neighbors, ourselves, those were specifically chosen to appeal to both people of faith and many faiths, as well as people of no faith. Uh, so I haven't found people of no faith necessarily rejecting those ideas, but rather recognizing the importance of those values in their own life. When it comes, I would say for especially progressive communities, period, and progressive faith communities, um, there has been a um, general In our culture, it, it can feel a lot better sometimes and with a lot of the frustration that's been in place to kind of name and shame those who don't feel the same way we do, whether that's in person, on social media, et cetera, as if by doing so, they're all of a sudden gonna get woke and just change. And I'd love for that to happen. I'd love that they could just wake up like Scrooge did in the Christmas Carol after they got a visit from three ghosts overnight and they got woke and they're good to go. But in my experience in life, that's just not the way that humanity, our broken humanity works. Um, and so that's part of why we created the stranger to neighbor model. It's doing that initial education. We talked earlier about the, you know, is there a line to get into and status and all those kind of things. I found generally, there's about 10% of our population that we're not gonna reach in this lifetime. I think you gotta figure out who's worth talking to who's not. But I think there are generally reasonable people that if they learn the facts instead of just all the myths they've been bombarded with, would at least be open. But just learning the facts is not going to get them to ultimately change their heart and mind. It's the relationships that do. And so we think relationships are absolutely essential to this. When an issue becomes personal and they care about somebody who's caught up in the immigration system, that's when people get a, you know, a match lid underneath their bum and they, they start all of a sudden taking action in ways that really surprise them and they start taking risky action. Um, and and usually that process of heart and mind change takes months to years, it doesn't happen overnight. So I don't blame the people on the progressive side saying we need revolution and we need it now. And our job is not to placate those that are not where we're at. And so I don't blame them for moving forward and, and trying to you know, retake power and, and speak truth to power, et cetera. But I also think there's got to be at the same time another movement that is meeting people where they're at and helping them evolve. It can't, you know, it, for me, it's got to be both evolution, revolution and evolution. I just wish that humanity evolved quicker because people are suffering now and we can't always wait for people to evolve. But I think it, it, when it comes to faith, we're called and within the Christian faith, Jesus was both a radical prophet. Jesus was who challenged the power structures. Jesus was also a counselor to unexpected folks who met them where they're at and helped them evolve over time. And I think we're called to do the exact same thing. Well, wow, amen to that, to all of that, that you just mentioned. Um, that's, that's just so important. It is, it is about meeting people where they're at um, and kind of making those relationships and deep, diving deeper into those relationships to actually see some change um, and evolution. So, um, so I'm, since we're kind of that this legislative seminar is happening, I want to kind of bring it back to some of those um, bills that you were talking about. Do you know about um, any of the Sheriff's Association and where their stance is on SB 101 and HB 62? I, I don't, and somebody else on the call may know this, and if you do type it in, I haven't heard official statements um, on, from either the good bills or the bad bills. I know that there are some behind the scenes conversations taking place between local sheriffs and chiefs, police chiefs with those associations to ask them to come out and say something. Um, but I, um, I don't think that's quite happened yet, but their voices, you know, if the driver's license bill was to ever have a chance to reach folks who are not open to it right now, especially within the Republican party, it's going to be insurance companies and chief, uh, police chief and sheriff associations. Um, and so I know that they, they have, within that leadership of those associations, they have diversity of opinions too. Um, and it largely is along the lines of how they view immigration and, and all of that, those issues on a political level. So uh, I, I don't know, but somebody else on the uh, call may have heard if they did release statements. Yeah, and feel free for y'all, if you want, <clears throat> if you know, you can just feel free to just drop that in the chat. 
Um, so yeah, it is, um, it's my understanding that people, you know, are fleeing their homes due to climate impacts, environmental disasters, um, do not have refugee status. Um, can you speak to this? And are you seeing an increase in people migrating due to ecological changes like drought um, and flood? And how can we maybe expand refugee status in a way that includes this population? I mean, that's a, that's a question essentially that can't be, I mean, that, that would take a, a good day seminar to get into, but the, but the individual's question is a very important one because we're, we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg in terms of migration in this, in, in worldwide. And when I say devastating poverty and violence, some of the root causes of that poverty and violence is absolutely related um, in some locations directly related to ecological change and global warming. Um, and so I would just simply say that we are going to, one, we need just some massive reform in our immigration laws to help folks coming at the border now and the folks that are already here and have limited or no status. But yeah, we're gonna, faith communities are really going to need to determine where do they sit on this issue? Not only in terms of how they feel about it value-wise, but how, what are they willing to do to step up? Because there's gonna be a lot more folks coming and are you willing not only advocate politically, but to open up your homes, to provide funds to ensure they have decent living and can meet their basic needs, to pay for those legal fees. Um, and again, for me, that is directly related to the over 40 times we're called to welcome the stranger and love our neighbor as ourselves. That shouldn't be a, a chore, but something that congregations very much look forward to um, and seeing it directly related to growth in their faith. Um, and thankfully, there are some really good examples um, in North Carolina, I would say, especially with faith communities or faith-based nonprofits uh, and across this country, um, and it's growing. But I would say that the sooner your congregation can have this conversation and say, what are we uniquely called to do on this front, the better, because it's, it's here and it's only going to increase in the years to come. Mm -hmm. And it was going to require both federal reforms and response but it's also really going to require what faith communities are willing to do at the local level in rural areas, mm -hmm. as well as large, large cities. Absolutely. I completely agree. I mean, it's time now for us to be taking bold action, those steps toward radical hospitality, as people have been saying in the chat. Um, so I think we have maybe time for one or two more questions. Um, let me just briefly look over. Um, I think someone did mention um, that in Raleigh, there's a mission under the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship and welcome is Welcome House. Um, it helps resettle immigrants in the Triangle. Um, I think there was another question on maybe what services or organizations are there in the Triangle. Um, maybe that was a response, but can you at all speak to um, services or organizations you know of that are in the Triangle? I mean, um, USCIR um, and Church World Service do a lot of work with refugee uh, and unaccompanied minor populations. Um, there are uh, groups like uh, El Centro and La Semilla who are um, also doing a lot of direct services, especially to the Spanish speaking populations and helping people meet their basic needs and legal services and ID cards, et cetera. There are also a lot of, of immigrant led groups out there that may not have 501c3 status yet that are also doing some services and I would say are especially strong on the advocacy front uh, at both the state, local state and federal levels. And those groups absolutely deserve uh, the support as much as uh, anybody else. So um, I, I would say, you know, find a good balance between supporting some of the large organizations and some of the smaller grassroots uh, groups. Um, and uh, again, you'll see most of these, these kind of both of the larger nonprofits and the smaller grassroots groups in places like Asheville, like mm -hmm. Greensboro, like Raleigh, um, you know, but I would say that there are also some terrific groups in places like, you know, Hickory and Wilmington and Morganton and Roanoke Rapids. And a lot of those include churches that are doing some great outreach. So please don't forget about uh, those groups in, in more rural communities in North Carolina as well. Mm -hmm. There's um, not maybe an exhaustive list that's been created, but if you specifically have an area where you wanna help somebody, you know, feel free to, you know, Rachel knows a lot of folks, I do as well, feel free to reach out. We can recommend some folks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know we're about to wrap up, but I really do love the work that you're doing with the Strange to Neighbor program. I mean, I think that's just amazing work that congregations can just easily do to start building some of those relationships and um, having those honest, you know, deeper dive into those relationships and that connection. 
um, and just learning about new cultures and traditions and all of that. Um, I know you said congregations should just get involved and get in touch with you. Is that the best way to reach you, just emailing you, or is there somewhere specific on the site that um, congregations can look up to um, kind of get more involved in that? Yeah, faithaction.org, um, uh, more about us, uh, and the emails are there, but I'm going to put mine in the chat as well here, uh, an email, and folks can absolutely reach out. Um, and again, if we're not the right group to, to connect to you with, there's plenty of others we, we can. Um, and uh, yeah, keep in mind all those different ways we talked about to take action. Uh, if you want to just consult about some of the best ways to do that, happy to do that. And if you're interested in that Stranger to Neighbor Congregations initiative, uh, please do reach out as well. Um, we're starting to recruit for that in North Carolina um, this summer. So. Well, great. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate you coming on and presenting to us. I always find you so, so graceful when you present. And I could listen to you present all day long, really. Um, so we're so grateful to have you here. That means a lot. And uh, again, keep up the, the great work. And thanks to all those who are putting their faith into action across the, uh, the state. Um, proud to be associated with the North Carolina Council. Uh, you all have had a proud reputation nationally for, for a long time. So keep it up. Um, yeah, keep it up. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so everyone, we're going to just close out with a little litany. Um, we have been just staying muted, but I think maybe if you want to unmute yourselves in response, I like the cacophony of all people speaking at once. If it makes us feel more connected, um, feel free if you want to unmute yourself just in response. Um, right. God of peace, you have shown yourself to us yes, as one who one demonstrated what true power yeah, looks okay. like okay. for refusing yeah. to use yeah. violence. Yeah. We are willing, we are willing, to, willing to follow your, your way, way of peace. peace. God of justice, you have invited us to peacemaking work of showing us justice is the first ingredient. We are willing to learn the way of justice. God of righteousness, you have provided the environment of all creation to flourish and walk your righteous path. We are willing to be your righteous people. Amen. Amen, everyone. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, make sure to just join us for the rest of this week, our legislative seminars. We've got so many things planned. Um, just use the same link. So blessings on all of you. We'll see you soon, hopefully.